Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is the beginning of a character study on Abraham. You know, I don't know how many sessions it will take, but uh, I suspect it will take more than one at least. Uh, I'm going to uh, just look up the word, the name Abraham in the concordance on Bible Hub. And every time the name Abraham appears in Scripture, I'm just going to look at the verse and Let's see what we can learn about Abraham as we go through this. Uh, let's begin right now. Uh, Abraham in Genesis eleven twenty seven. Now this is the history of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. Uh, you. You may be aware already that uh, Abram's original name uh, was Abram, not Abraham. As we go through this study, at a certain point, you'll notice that his name gets changed to, to Abraham. This has uh, happened numerous times in the scriptures, and uh, when we get to that point, we'll discuss uh, you know, the significance of that change. So this is uh, really just the point where we're looking at the origin uh, of uh, Abraham, his uh, family line, uh, Terah was his father, T-E-R-A-H. Then we look at it, Genesis eleven twenty nine. Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. That's spelled S-A-R-A-I. Uh, and the name of uh, Nahor's wife, <coughs> Milcah, the daughter of Haran, who was also the father of Iska. Now, you should also make note that uh, not only was Abram uh, his original name, and then it became Abraham, but the same thing is true with his wife. His wife's name was Sarai, S-A-R-A-I. And then at a certain point in time, we'll discover that uh, uh, it's also true that Sarai's name was changed to Sarah. Now let's look at Genesis 11.31. Terah took Abram, his son, Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, uh, his son Abram's wife. They went forth from Ur, 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 of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. They came to Haran and lived there. So here we're just seeing that uh, uh, as not only was uh, a Abram now married to Sarai, uh, but it's talking about how they went from this land of Ur to the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. Uh, let's look at Genesis 12, 1 now. Now Yahweh... I thought I had the KJV. I thought I had the KJV. Yeah. Well, let's look at this in another translation. What does it say instead of Yahweh? This is 12.1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram. I don't know. I must have the setting uh, wrong on this Bible hub because it's giving me some strange translation here. Um, so now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. So here we have Abram being told by God uh, to leave the, the country and his family and for his father's house uh, to a land where the Lord will show him. Uh, oops, let's go to back now to uh, Genesis 12, 2, 12, 4. Uh, now it says, uh, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him 
and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. <clears throat> so now well, let's look at, he was 75 years old already at this point. Uh, now look at uh, Genesis 12, 5. Abram took Sarai, his wife, Lot with his brother's son, all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls whom they had gotten in Aaron, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. Into the land of Canaan they came. So we're seeing now that, uh, you know, he's on this journey with his wife and his uh and Lot, his uh, brother's son. So Ab Abram is the uncle of Lot. Now, Genesis 12, 5, Abram took Sarah, his wife. Oh, no, let's look in Genesis 12, 6. Abram passed through the land into the place of Shechem, to the oak of Mori. The Canaanite was then in the land. So he's in the land where the Canaanites live. And in 12.7, it says, uh, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed I, will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. So this point, the Lord is giving this piece of land to, to Abram and also to the descendants of Abram. And the land is uh, where the it's land of Canaan. Um, Genesis 12, 7, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your seed. He built an altar there to Yahweh who appeared to him. Genesis 12, 9, Abram traveled, going on still toward the south. And then Genesis 12, 10, there was a famine in the land. Abram went down into Egypt to live as a foreigner there, for the famine was severe in the land. Genesis 12, 14, it happened that when Abram had come into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Well, let's look at a little more context around that because it's very interesting what happens. Um, AJV. Uh, Abram is saying to Sarai now, please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. It came about when Abram came into Egypt the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. So here we have um, Abraham uh, afraid for his life, thinking that because his wife was beautiful, that Pharaoh the Egyptians would just take his wife and kill him. Uh, so he wanted Sarai to say that uh, she was his sister. Now, I don't, I'm not positive that this is true. I, I didn't research this before I started today, but I believe I've learned somewhere that uh, uh, Sarai was indeed the sister of Abram. Uh, somehow, the genealogies at that time, uh, uh, the relationships as, as the people had it at that time, maybe are not exactly as, as we see relationships now. Uh, obviously, in the beginning, with Adam and Eve and their immediate descendants, the marriage had to take place with brother and sister. And so uh, here we are further along in history, and if it is the case that Sarai was actually a sister or a close relative of Abram. Then they got married. And even at this point, it's not uh, forbidden. Uh, I guess later at some point in history, the um, 
it's there's a it's established that siblings should not marry each other. So, uh, but the main thing we want to learn from this is that Abram was afraid for his life and thought it was good to, to lie about their relationship and not not um, let anybody know that they were husband and wife. So the question is, is this lie justified? Oh, I watched a video, I think yesterday or the day before about ads from um, the YouTuber Ads for Christ. And he was asking that question, is, is it every okay for Christians to lie? And he made the case that, yeah, when it's to pr protect someone, you can lie to protect someone. So in this case, the question is, was this lie justified? Uh, we're gonna find out later though that uh, Pharaoh is quite shocked when he learns the, the truth. But um, let's go on now to the next verse. Uh, Genesis 12, 16. He dealt well with Abram for her sake. He had sheep, cattle, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So um, Abram was doing really quite well in Egypt. Um, 12, 18, Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Uh, Pharaoh commanded men concerning him and they brought him on the way with his wife and all that he had. So they were sent out of, uh, of Egypt. Let me look at this in context and make sure I remember this correctly. Uh, but the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. Well, it seems that uh, Abram was, was willing for his wife to be taken by Pharaoh and Pharaoh made her his wife, and I'm assuming that as wife, they had, they had uh, uh, conjugation, they had sexual relations. Uh, I don't know of anything that says pro or con on that, but I, I think it's fair to assume that. And Abraham did that all because he was afraid for his life. So uh, this lie led to that, and then the Lord uh, put some plagues on the house of Pharaoh, and once Pharaoh understood what was happening, he sent uh, Abram and Sarai away. It's really interesting how uh, all the characters, the scriptures, um, even those characters who we esteem so highly, like Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, um, David, Moses. These are some of the most famous and esteemed characters of scripture. And yet there is a lot of uh, history, bad history, that we, when we really study the lives, we find out that they were all very tainted uh, in, in one way or another, either they had murdered or uh, adultery or just lied like this, like Abram lied about Sarai. So now I can't think of anything that comes to mind that is negative about Joseph. Uh, I've talked about the uh, 11th son of Jacob. Uh, uh, I can't think of anything negative about Enoch. So there are some exceptions where I can't hear, think of anything negative about the Apostle John. So there, there are some cases. But I find it very interesting that 
some of the most respected, admired, loved characters of scriptures are so tainted. Well, it's true for everyone that we all fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. So um, really shouldn't be a big surprise to us, I guess. Okay, now let's go back to... Uh, uh, Genesis, now we're going to Genesis 13, 1. Abram went up out of Egypt, he, his wife, all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Um, to the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between me and you and between herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are relatives. And then they separated. Uh, Abram was generous in giving Lot his choice uh, to choose the, the land that he would go to. And, uh, they, they felt that Lot felt that the, the land that they were on was not sufficient for two large families. So they needed another parcel of land. So they decided to go their separate ways. And Lot got to pick. So in this way, it seems that Abram was really quite generous letting Lot decide. And Lot chose what you'd think would be the, the better parcel of land. Um, so Abram lived in the land of Canaan, and Lot lived in the cities of the plain, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now, uh, thirteen fourteen, uh, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot was separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. Uh, Uh, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. So this is the land that uh, the Lord gave to, to Abram and his descendants. And that land was decreed to be Abram and his family's land permanently and that's the land in the middle east where all throughout history there has been such a struggle over that land and uh, we'll learn later that first of all you have the people who were on that land before the lord gave it to abram uh, there's a dis dispute about that uh, that this continues through history and then there's also a dispute between Abram's family, descendants, the branches of his uh, family tree, fighting over who deserves that land. You'll find it later that this is, this is what leads to the dispute that we see even today between um, uh, the Arabs and the Jews, the, 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 and now the Muslims and the Jews, over, over that land in the Middle East. It's a family dispute. Um, uh, now Genesis 13, 18, Abram moved his tent and came and lived by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to Yahweh, to the Lord. Um, Genesis 14, 13, one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, now he lived by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Eskel and brother of Aner, and there were allies of Abram. So let's look at the context of that. It's, um, this is talking about how a lot was attacked. Let me go back a little further. Genesis 14. Yeah. 
All right, so there, there was a battle between four kings over this uh, land where, where um, Lot went. And Lot was caught up in that. It says they also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram was, okay, so Abram then decides that uh, that he would go help his nephew Lot. Um, so it says, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 train, man, train men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedor Leomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of, the, of God most high, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So that brings up another real interesting subject. Uh, who was this Melchizedek? Uh, there's only a little bit said about Melchizedek. Here, here's he's identified as a king of Salem. The word Salem means peace, the king of peace. We know that Jesus is, uh, is the title of a prince of peace. Uh, and he, he's, he's the priest of God Most High. Uh, so this, the question is, what kind of a person was Melchizedek? Because Melchizedek is, uh, uh, in the scriptures it says that he does not have mother or father. And he, doesn't have, uh, he doesn't have a beginning or an ending. The way it's described describes in Melchizedek, that description is only given about Jesus. So I, I don't know how theologians would divide over this, but I know that there are some theologians that conclude that uh, Melchizedek is a Christophany. Uh, Christophany means that uh, uh, a pre-incarnation appearance on the, in the earth uh, of Jesus, and uh, now there's another word called theophany, which means it's a pre-incarnation of of God, not not particularly Jesus, but of God. Uh, and a theophany may be when it says God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, that would be a theophany, and then. This case might be a Christophany because it seemed to be more description about uh, the the attributes and words that we commonly use to describe Jesus. So uh, I'm not going to try to uh, come down a real hard on one side or the other, but it seems to me that Melchizedek could not be a, a mortal human being as uh, as we think of a king regularly. But uh, so. Melchizedek uh, praised uh, Abram, and and Abram gave him a tenth of everything, which were the spoils of this war, this battle. They, when Abram took his three hundred and eighteen trained men, and they defeated this other army, and they obviously had the spoils of that war, and then he gave a tenth to to Abram, I mean to uh, Melchizedek. And it says, uh, but Abram said to the king of Sodom, uh, 
Uh, then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, with raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. To Aner, Esco, and Mamre, let them have their share. I find it really interesting that in some ways Abram seems so noble and such a good character. And then in other ways, it's just a, a dichotomy. He, he seems like a uh, willing to do anything to survive, even say that Sarah was not his wife and, and that uh, let the Pharaoh take his own wife and marry her. All right, let's go a little further now looking at these appearances of the name room here. Uh, Genesis 15.1. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision saying, don't be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Abram said, to, said, Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and he who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. Verse 15, 13, I mean, verse 3. Abram said, behold, to me you have given no seed, and behold, no one, uh, and behold, one born in my house is is my heir. That doesn't seem right. Behold, to me you have given no seed, and behold, one born in my house is my heir. Let me look at that again. Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. I don't know. I don't, it's not making a lot of sense to me because he's, he really at this point does not have anyone born in his house that's the heir. The verse just before it contradicts it. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. So uh, whoever um, Abram is referring to as his heir currently, he says he's born in his house. Apparently that has a different meaning because we know that he was not born, born from his loin, or it says here, uh, this man will not be your ear, but one who will come forth from your own body. So maybe it's just a question of the language that's used, but uh, uh, when Abram says, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Uh, that wouldn't make sense to me. I don't, let's look at that and see if I can find another translation. It seems like all these translations are saying the same thing about this. One born in my house is my heir. Uh, 15.3. Uh, here's a Matthew Henry's concise commentary. Though we must never complain of God, yet we have leave to complain to him and to state all our grievances. It is ease to a burdened spirit to open its case to a faithful and compassionate friend. Abram's complaint is that he had no child, that he was never likely to have any, 
that the want of a son was so great a trouble to him that it took away all his comfort. If we suppose that Abram looked no further than outward comfort, this complaint was to be blamed. <clears throat> but if we suppose that Abram there, herein had reference to the promised seed, his desire was very commendable. <clears throat> hmm. Well, I still don't claim to understand it when it means that since you have given me no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Well, if anybody can explain that to me, I'd appreciate your help. Okay, 15.3. Um, Genesis 15.5. Um, and he brought him up. And he took him outside, oops, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. <clears throat> so, even though Abram is distressed and worried, maybe heartbroken that he hasn't had his own son. And here God makes him this promise that his offspring are going to be a great number. He points to the stars to give him an illustration of how great his, his family will become. Uh, let's look at that a little further. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Okay, 6. Genesis 15, 6. Okay. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. To me, this, this verse 6 is a very, very important verse because we have the Apostle Paul and also uh, James the author of the book of James, um, cite this, this case here, uh, that this, what happened here. The, James says that, that uh, Abram was declared righteous by uh, being willing to um, kill his son, uh, Isaac on the altar to sacrifice his son. He was willing to do it. And James says that's what declared, that's when the, the Lord declared Abram is righteous. Paul, Paul cites this verse here that Abram was declared righteous before that. Abram was declared righteous when he first believed the Lord's promise and he trusted the Lord. The, Abram thought he was hopeless, he wouldn't have his own children, and the Lord made him this promise, and then because Abram believed him, even though it seemed so impossible and far-fetched, Abram believed him, and because of that belief, Abram was uh, declared righteous. So, <coughs> this is an example of how believing in God believing in the promise of God, his faithfulness, uh, is always what made us righteous in God's sight. It, it was never by some kind of act of obedience, like being willing to sacrifice Isaac, or, or being willing or acting out some kind of uh, good deeds or uh, refraining from, from bad deeds. 
our actions have never been what uh, gives us righteousness. It's our it's our belief. So this is a uh, Abraham was declared righteous when he believed, and then he believed in the Lord. And he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Fifteen five. Uh, let's look at uh, Genesis fifteen eleven. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Look at the context of that. God confirms his promise. Well, let's look at that. Uh, 10. Let's look at Genesis 15. Uh, so the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace, and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pit pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt, to the great river of the Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites, Kenites, Kenzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, <laughs> Rephites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. So, all these people who had that land before God gave it to Abel. Uh, most people, they don't recognize this uh, proclamation of giving the land to, to Abel. They, they, they believe that uh, just as in, in America, uh, much uh, our country here in the United States was, was all conquered from the, the Native Americans. Uh, by Spain and England. And then when we became a country, the United States, uh, we took this for our own from, from uh, Great Britain. And then eventually we took more and more, more of it that was at that time owned by Spain. But there are people in Mexico now that they, they say, well, they believe that California, Arizona, New Mexico, all these lands that were owned originally by, by Spain and were part of Mexico, that they don't recognize uh, that this is now the land of the United States. They think it should be their land. So you, probably all over the world this is true, where people had land and then other people came in and took the land. And then eventually, some other people came in and took the land from them. So each of the prior holders of the land, owners of that land, 
uh, many, many cases they feel that that land was unfairly taken from them and they still think it should be their land. So there's a dispute over it. So I can see how all of these tribes of people, even today their descendants, who do not, do not recognize that God Almighty gave this land to Abel. They don't recognize that. So to this day, they still want to fight and try to get that land back from Israel. Uh, and as we'll go into later, we'll find also that there are two brothers, um, uh, Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, they both have claim to the land. And then uh, two other brothers, uh, Jacob and Esau, uh, their, their family lines uh, broke off, and each of those sides think that they have claims to the land. So this land in the Middle East, a lot of people believe that that land is legally theirs. That's why throughout history you've seen people just continually battle and um, different people taking possession of the land. Even today, the problems in the Middle East, much of it is to do with uh, who is the legal owner of that land. Okay. Let's go on now to... Uh, Let's go to 16, uh, 16, 2. Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. Please go into my handmaid. It may be that I will obtain children by her. Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Let me look at this. Uh, in context here. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar, the Egyptian, her handmaid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. So on one hand, we have Abram declared righteous because he believed the Lord. The Lord promised him, your descendants will be like these stars. That's how vast your family will be. And this land will all be yours. And Abram believed him. And because of that belief, his faith was counted as righteousness. But the years go by, and there's no child between Abram and Sarai. And so the doubt creeps in, particularly with Sarai. <laughs> and Sarai uh, finally decides that she's going to make it happen on her own. This is a picture of... Uh, Faith versus works again. Just, just as Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves up through their own labor by sewing fig leaves together, but they could that it was an improper covering. God had to provide the covering through a skin of an animal. Just as Cain tried to provide an offering to God through the works of his hands, through all farming and all his labors, God said that's not an acceptable offering. It's your own works. He accepted the offering of Abel, which was just a blood sacrifice, which was a picture of the blood sacrifice in the future, Jesus dying on the cross. Now we have a picture here of Sarai. Abram had faith. As time goes on, Pharaoh, Sarai doesn't have faith, and she puts the doubt in Abram's mind, and she decides that they got to take action on their own. Through their own effort, they're going to make this happen. They can get an error. So she has Abram take the handmaiden, Hagar, who was an Egyptian, and... Uh, 
let's see what happens. Genesis 16.5, Sarai said to Abram, this wrong is your fault. I gave my handmaid into your bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and you. Well, now we have jealousy entering the picture. It was Sarai's idea that Abram take on this handmaiden, this Egyptian woman, Hagar, and now she gets impregnated, and now she's complaining. When he went into Hagar, that means he had sexual intercourse with Hagar, and she conceived, and so now she's pregnant. And when she, when she saw that she had conceived, when Sarai saw that Hagar conceived, her mistress, uh, Sarai, was despised in her sight. So Hagar despised uh, Sarai. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done me upon you May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid unto your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. Oh boy, the schemes of man or oh, woman. <laughs> Sarah decides she's going to solve this problem. She doesn't have faith. She doesn't believe that God's going to uh, um, make Abram and Sarah conceive a child. She doesn't believe that she's able to do it. She decides to take initiative, do it on her own. And then when Hagar gets pregnant, and Hagar is all proud that she's the one that got pregnant, and Sarai couldn't, and Sarai gets very jealous and angry with her. So now, Abram, he says, that's okay, just do with her whatever you want. So she treats her, mistreats her, and it's okay with Abram. So here we have this wonderful, esteemed, hero of the scriptures, heroes of faith. Uh, here, they, they're conducting themselves in a way that no one could condone it. No one could respect or admire this kind of behavior by Sarai or Abram. Um, now let's, let's look at Genesis 16.6. Um, and the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said to Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. 
and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man, <laughs> every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Wow, what a prophecy. So she's like being mistreated, and she leaves and goes out, and the angel of the Lord consoles her and says, Go back, serve Sarai, give birth to this child. Name him Ishmael. And from him, I promise you, he will become this great nation. But this is how they describe him. He will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. Well, I guess I'll let the cat out of the bag. From Ishmael, uh, we get the mixing of the... Uh, Abram family line with the Egyptians. And that from that family line, that family tree, we come, we come all the, the, the Arab nations. And from that come these Muslim, the Muslim people. And we 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 see what's happened. That Ishmael his descendants have all been fighting against uh, Abram's and Sarai's family line, which will be Isaac. Uh, and we're coming to Isaac next, but uh, uh, from one branch of this family tree, we had Isaac, and Judaism, and then Christianity. From the other branch of the family tree, we get the Arab nations and the Muslim people. Half brothers, both the seed of Abram, Isaac from Sarai, Ishmael from Hagar, the Egyptian. Uh, and the angel of the Lord said to her, okay. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me, for she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Bir la Heroi. <laughs> Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son. And Abram call, called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old. That fourscore is, a score is 20, so that's 86 years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Well, not only, of course, is Abram getting really old, at least... By today's standards, 86 is, by anybody's standards today, is old. How was it in the, at that time? Well, we know that it's uh, not very old compared to uh, the original genealogies we see uh, when we get to, you know, I, uh, for between Abraham, I mean, between Adam and Noah, that the, the lifespan was great. Five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years old. So now that eighty-six doesn't seem old by comparison, but apparently uh, Sarai was old, and at that point, being given birth to children was uh, probably was out of the question. People think, well, if you haven't given birth at this point, you're barren. You're too old. Of course, we know that now. I'm assuming that. Same thing happened physiologically then, is that uh, at a certain point, a woman goes through a change of life and she, she stops menstruating and she, be, she becomes unable to uh, bear a child. So it seems at this point, Sarai would be uh, unable to get, bear a child. And that's why she's resorted to this, um, her own scheme. 
and having Sarai, I mean, having Hagar lay with Abram and they come up with Ishmael. Uh, but what I find interesting about this, the angel of the Lord told Hagar, um, name him Ishmael. Now, I might be wrong, but uh, I thought that the the man in, in uh, at this time in history, the the the, the husband would always chose the name. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but uh, apparently Hagar she she tells must have told Abram that the, an angel told her to name him Ishmael, or maybe she didn't tell, say that. Maybe she just said she wanted the name of Ishmael. But for some reason, uh, Abram agreed, and his name was Ishmael. Okay. Let's go on to Genesis chapter 17. Okay, 71. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. 17. Let's look at it, KJV. And when Abram was 90 years old at 9, 99. So he was 86, now he's 99, so that's 13 years. So at this point, if it took almost a year for Ishmael to be born, Ishmael is probably 12 years old at this point. Uh, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So here we have again the Lord repeating this promise to Abram. He promised him two things. This land, as far as you can see, is will be yours. The sky, all the stars, your descendants will be that great. And you will hear, you will be the father of many nations. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So this is God repeating this again. Uh, I don't know how old Abram was the first time God spoke to him and made these, started making these promises, but I can recall now three times God made these, this kind of a promise to Abram, and now he's 99. Um, uh, and God said unto Abram, Abraham. So here's something interesting. Verse Verse 5. This is the same chapter, Genesis 17. Verse 5. Neither shall thy name anymore be Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So at this point, you won't see the name Abram appear again. It's Abraham now. And I don't know what the actual meanings of Abram and Abraham are. <clears throat> but uh, Abraham here 
Maybe it means this, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Does Abraham mean a father of many nations? I don't know. I don't want to look that up right now, but <clears throat> it is important that God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Uh, and he repeats the promises, but now he has the, now he's called Abraham. <clears throat> God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant before thou, and that thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man uh, child in your generations, he that is born in the house or brought, bought with money or any stranger, which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh or of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul, soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And verse 15, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is 99, that is 90 years old, bear? <laughs> and Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Wow. I'm going to stop uh, today's study right here. Uh, this is an amazing point. A lot, a lot of amazing things to be uh discussed from this portion of scriptures. So I'll make a note here. Uh, Genesis 17, 17, 9. Genesis 17, 9. I'll come back and pick up there next time. It's amazing. Uh, Kind of turning point here they get new names and the promise is repeated and now even abraham this man of faith he is declared righteous because he believed god and now he's laughing not believing god okay we'll pick that up there next time uh let me the last thing i want to say is hmm um i see brother sam was here at one point i guess i didn't even recognize he was there he's gone now but um as we we study abraham there's an awful lot to be learned about the man and his experiences and his relationship and these promises well, I, I, I find it interesting reviewing it again it's going to be fascinating as we go forward but the most important thing i want everybody to know in every one of my videos is what we learned when the scripture says abram believed the lord and he was declared righteous um that's how we get declared righteous by god by believing god it it's not because of 
the religious things we do, like Abraham being willing to sacrifice his son, Isaac. It, it, it's not because of a person being willing to, you know, uh, change their life and attempt to, you know, get sin out of their life, become a religious person and, or do good deeds and give to charity. No, it, it said that Abram was declared righteous because he believed God. And as we go through all the scripture, we find out it's the same thing over and over again. From beginning to end, salvation comes by believing God. Now, what does God want us to believe today? Uh, now we know a lot more about God and salvation than Abram knew at that time. He just knew that God was speaking to him, making a promise, and he believed that God was able and would be faithful to keep this promise. And Abram was saved, declared righteous. But now we know so much more about, about God, and, and uh, we're expected to believe certain things. We must believe that what Jesus said, that he said he came down from heaven. Scriptures say that God was manifest in the flesh. Scripture say that Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus said the reason he came down from heaven and, and became a man was in order to, to die. God can't die. He had to become a man so that he could die. Because scriptures tell us the wages of sin is death. Because all men have, men have sinned. Every person, as even as we see Abram, this great hero of the scriptures, as we find so many of these great characters in the scriptures, and yet they're liars and thieves and murderers, and just the, the type of sin, the number of sin is just, it's, it's, it's amazing. And yet these are the great figures of the scriptures that, that God loved and that we admire, but they're so flawed. Just as I am flawed and you are flawed, scripture says, we all fall short of the glory of God. When we are measured against God, we fall short. The measurement we have to uh, reach is the standard set by Jesus Christ. He lived this perfect, sinless life. Here's perfection. And here I am way down here. And maybe here you are. Here you are. But we, we all fall short of the standard God expects, which is the standard fulfilled through Jesus, his life. And so God knowing that we could not live up to the standard of perfection and because we all sin, sin was a barrier. We couldn't have this relationship with God throughout eternity because here we are here, God is in their sin separating us. That barrier had to be removed. Wages soon as death, so someone had to die. God said, I'll become a man. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, so that I can die. And he did. He, came, he did what he came to do. He willingly went to a cross. He suffered and died on the cross to pay for our sins. And the scriptures tell us that all of our sins were charged against Jesus as he died on the cross. So the good news is that it doesn't matter how many sins you have in your lifetime. They were all charged against Jesus. He paid for them all. It doesn't matter the variety of sins. Some people want to uh, rate sins and say this sin is far more serious than that sin. It doesn't matter the type of sin or the number of sin. All of our sins were charged to Jesus and our sins paid for. So now, see, God and man, there's no barrier. It was removed. Now you're free to come to Jesus and embrace him and have this relationship with Jesus as Savior God. Now, why should you believe this? What, why, what and, and how in the world are, are we justified in, in putting our faith in Jesus? Well, Jesus said that he would prove 
to you that he is God and Savior. And he said he would do it by raising himself from the dead after three days. And this resurrection actually happened. And, and that's the proof that he gave to the, the early church, the apostles and disciples at that time. They saw him. They touched him. He ate with them. He proved that he has the power over life and death. So you should feel confident in trusting Jesus. He said, I will give you life everlasting if you believe in me. Believing in Jesus means you believe in his ability. You believe that he alone has the ability to give you eternal life. Believing in Jesus means that you believe in his faithfulness. Believe that when he promises eternal life to everyone who believes in him, he, he does not lie. He is faithful. He keeps his promises. So believe in Jesus. Believe in his ability to save you. Believe in his faithfulness to save you. Believe on Jesus. That means that you're depending on him. You're not trying to do it on your own through religion. You're depending on him instead. It's real easy. All you got to do is, as, as uh, uh, Abram did, he believed God. He believed what God promised him. See these stars? I'm going to make your family that great. See this land? As far as you can see, I'm going to give it to you. And he, Abram believed him. And at that point, he was declared righteous. Do you want to be declared righteous? Do you want to be declared blameless? Do you want to be accepted by God? Do you want to have a relationship with God? His name is Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.